The following is an exclusive presentation of WI Garden Media, the voice of Garden Talk Radio. Coming up on the program today, we're going to go over storing your harvest the right way or the best way and animals in the garden, how to deal with the good ones and get rid of the bad ones. Our guest will be host of PBS's Growing a Greener World, Joe Lample, and we'll answer your garden questions. And that all starts right now. You are listening to the most informationally packed hour of garden-focused radio in the country and on the internet with your host, husband and wife team, Joey and Holly Baird. This is the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Welcome to the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Thank you for being part of the program today and allowing us to be part of your day. I'm your host, Joy Baird. Beside me is my wife, co-host, best friend, and gardening partner. Holly Baird. This program is for you, about you, to help your garden grow better, to maintain your landscape, grow healthier trees, make your grass look greener, as well as preserving what you grow. You're, there's several different ways in which you can get a hold of us. If you would like to do such, you can send us an email to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. That's gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Or you can give us a ring-a-ding-ding and put your fingers in your phone and give us a call at 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-7469. We thank you for listening to us, whether you're listening to us on one of the 15 AM and FM terrestrial radio stations that are broadcasting our program here in 2021 through a radio app, through a podcast replay, in-studio video replay, or through the Season 5 tab at the top of our parent website, that is the Wisconsin Vegetable Gardener. Dot com. Big show lined up for you, so Holly, let's get into it and talk about how to properly store your produce. Now, there's many different ways to do such. We're not going to go into the science and the deep dive into it, but we're just going to mention several of them and uh, what we feel is best via our experience. So one of the, I don't know if there's a best way to store your harvest, but one of the most well-known ways that a lot of people are getting back into is through canning. Yeah, uh, we've seen this and we've talked about it on the program where we can't find the canning lids. Uh, we can find lots and lots of jars, but we can't find the actual lids. And, and Holly, you talked to, uh, what was it, Michael from Ball Customer Service, somewhere in that range? Like Consumer Services, yeah. But yeah, he talked to us about the lids and what had happened was is that they had people were basically stockpiling the lids last year. And then they were selling them. Some, not all. Not all, but some were selling them to make a profit. And now Ball had to ramp up their production to make up for that quote-unquote loss. So canning is kind of like the go-to, the number one thing in which you can do. But we don't always can everything that we grow. We, for example, green beans, we do not can them. No, we prefer them by freezing them. We have canned them in the past. It is something that a lot of people do. There's nothing wrong with canning them, but we just... How 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 do how do we uh, freeze ours? Sure. So, well, we freeze ours just because we like the texture better. But we freeze ours, we do like a, what's called a parboiling or um, a blanching. And what you do is you just put them in boiling hot water for about a minute or so, and then you put them directly into an ice bath to stop that cooking. And then when you want to eat them, you thaw them out, and then you cook them how you wish. Um, yeah, we, we've tried to, and back when <clears throat> many of you and I had grown up, you didn't pressure can green beans. You water bath them for like three hours or some crazy, uh, time duration such as that. Uh, but then it became unsafe for the water bath canning procedure to do. So that's why the national home for food preservation, national center for home food preservation, uh, deemed it unsafe unless you pressure can, but it's just too mushy for us. We just don't care much for the mushiness. Now, if you have the availability or, uh, mimic something such as a root cellar, you can do that. You can store it, you know, e- even a root cellar, not so much the traditional definition, but let's say a, a basement. Right. So, yeah, you could you could do a basement. You'd have to kind of figure out the best area, perhaps, because I know like some people's basements, they have are very climatized, very climatized. Some some basements are finished on one area and climatized and then not on another area. So 
Yeah, so you want to think about that. Um, if it's not climatized you and it does get cool enough during the winter, it's going to help keep those vegetables fresh, almost like a refrigerator. Well, some people, uh, some preppers uh, and some creative weekend warriors, they cre- create a root cellar on their property, basically uh, just digging a hole and, and creating the same type of environment. Or they take a refrigerator and, and puncture the holes in the right spot and all this and that in order for... Um, the uh, the air to circulate and do all what it needs to done, which That's, brings us into the next thing, which is carrots. Right. Well, I was just going to say that if you have an extra fridge, you know, some people have like a, a beverage fridge. Right. You could have like a food storage fridge. Uh, true. Yeah. So anyway, carrots, um, some people store their carrots in the ground. Um, and what they do is over winter, they don't harvest them in the end of the season well now when we say put them leave them in the ground it's not just oh look their tops we walk away they cover them with right. leaves straw a lot of organic yeah. material i was against yeah. that but yeah so what they do is they cover them with probably about two two to three feet of mulch or straw leaves what have you some sort of organic material to help kind of insulate them in a sense and then they would go out there and say oh, i'm gonna get a couple carrots for dinner or whatever, and then they go out and pull them out of the ground. Right, basically a refrigerator that prevents the ground from freezing to make easier access. And you can do similar things with Jerusalem artichokes uh, in that aspect as well. Now, right. whenever we harvest these things, whether we are harvesting potatoes, carrots, Jerusalem artichokes, etc., you don't just hit them with the hose as soon as you harvest them so they look all pretty for your picture. Right, so what you want to do is you want to leave the, the dirt on them, the soil on them, and you, you can still take your picture. They're still going to look nice. Yeah. But you want to leave that on there, and it kind of creates like a like a seal or like a barrier or whatever when you leave that dirt on there, and it's going to help them store a bit longer, whether it be in the fridge, if you have like a, a root cellar type thing, what have you. Well, and here's the other thing. we Whenever we store our items in the freezer, let's say you know we, we blanch them, whether it's kale or, or carrots or however we store them in the freezer, There is a difference between a freezer bag and a storage bag. Right, and I did want to touch on this is you want to think about that. The freezer bags are a little bit thicker in their texture, whatever you want to call it. Similar to a, there's a canning jar and then there's a glass jar that looks like a canning jar. Right, so these freezer bags are made for freezing and they don't cost a bunch more. They cost a little bit more, but they are worth that investment. Because they're designed to stand those long, cold temperatures in your freezer. And for us, I like the zipper top. Um, I'm not talking about like the, the scrunchy, like the push it, pinchy top. I like the ones that kind of zip along because that way I know it's getting nice and sealed. Right. But whatever you prefer is fine too. And whenever you are, uh, you know, processing or storing, you know, let's say storing your produce, you want to examine what you're harvesting. Now, whether, obviously... It depends on the produce, Holly. Uh, tomatoes have a shorter shelf life than a pumpkin. Uh, right. Leaf lettuce, shorter shelf life than a tomato. Right. That's another, Yeah, that's another thing is you want to think about that, what you're eating. But also, say you you dig up your potatoes mm-hmm. and you ding a couple with the shovel. No, you don't which... ding them. You jam them right through the heart of the potato like we all do <laughs> right. with our garden fork. Or we slice them. Oh, we're, gonna, we're far enough. Well, boom, you get three of them right there. Right. So, yeah, so you, you ding them, you jam your fork in there, whatever. And that, that does happen, so then you want to eat those potatoes first. Maybe you find a, a tomato with a blemish on it. You want to eat that tomato first, things like that. Um, the, the I don't want to call it damaged, but it is kind of damaged. Eat that first. Not, uh, yeah, you're not uh, long-term. Uh, it's going to go bad a lot quicker than what you imagine it could possibly go bad. So whenever you're, you're searching through the potatoes, and, and that's the other thing, when we're harvesting, let's say we are going to harvest a basket full of tomatoes that we're going to can on you know wednesday night it's saturday afternoon you got to be ginger with these things you just can't blop them in the basket because they're going to get bruised and any slight bruise or blemish by wednesday you're going to have now not one moldy rotten tomato you're going to have three or four that all sat next to one another and you've lost a good chunk of what you're intending to preserve in whatever fashion you were trying to save them right your your rotten friends are making other rotten friends 
Basically. So, yeah, whenever we are, you know, storing with later in the fall when we harvest our butternut squash, spaghetti squash, pumpkins, that type of thing, there is a curing process in which one needs to go through in order to thicken the skin for that long term uh, storage. And with garlic, many people are harvesting garlic now. You can use that garlic right away or you can do what is called a curing process and allowing the upper portion of the plant to dry and put more flavor and fr- uh, flavor into the bulb. And that will keep you for six, eight months, maybe nine months if things work out real well for you. And then you can, you know, save the larger bulbs for the largest cloves for this fall's planting too. So everything, obviously we can't cover everything to its uh, utmost uh, detail, but we can uh, kind of give you some guidelines on what to look for, what to do, what not to do when it comes to storing uh, the produce and what is coming out of your garden. I think the biggest thing is just keeping in mind how, how you're going to use it, what's going to be best for you, what's going to make sense in your home, and what's going to be the most uh, convenient, essentially. Exactly. Well, what's most convenient and the smart thing to do is to purchase from Walton's Incorporated, whether you are a butcher taking an animal from animal to edible or you just need some phenomenal seasonings to impress your friends and family this summer when you're barbecuing back on the patio porch or deck, Walton's has all of that and more to suffice your needs. Listen, everyone, we know you care about where your food comes from and canning and preserving, as we just talked about, your fruits and vegetables is great, but think about the meat. At waltonsinc.com, you can get all the equipment, seasoning, and supplies to make sausage, jerky, and any other meat product your way to your high standards. Do you want snack sticks that people will actually like? Walton's created meatgistics.com. It's an informational website to help you make the best finished product. They even have a full line of their own meat grinders, mixers, sausage stuffers, etc. to help you go from animal to edible. That's waltonsinc.com. And the informational website is meatgistics.com. Well, when we come back, hang around. It's all about keeping the good animals in your garden and getting the bad animals out. You're listening to the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show, a program to help your garden grow better. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Do your trees look sad? When we here at the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show gardens have tree and shrub issues, Dr. Jim's is the product we reach for as it is the product that works. It really provides results. Their small batch, extra potent blend of readily available nutrients is exactly what your trees, plants, and bushes need to regain their health and stay bug free. It's super easy to use. It feeds the microbes and adds new life to your soil so you can grow stronger plants. Chemical free, environmentally responsible fertilizer, that works. It will put a smile on you and your plants. To find out more about Tree Secret and other products, visit drjims.com. That's D R J I M Z. Dot com. Chip Drop is a website you can sign up for free wood chip mulch delivery right to your door. For free, Chip Drop connects homeowners and gardeners with tree services who are trying to get rid of their wood chips. You can also sign up to get free logs and firewood. Go to ChipDrop.com to learn more and sign up for a free account. CousinsCompost.com offers a full range of compost and vermicomposting supplies, including the new Royal All Natural Worm Bedding. Shop Cousins Compost for composting worms, worm castings, indoor and outdoor worm bins, and compost bins. Use coupon code REDWORM21 for 10% off your order at CousinsCompost.com. Deer Defeat is an all natural repellent to keep deer, rabbits, and groundhogs away from your precious plants. Deer Defeat protects your plants day and night dries clear and odorless it will not clog your sprayer deer defeat works for 30 days through rain snow and freeze safe effective and works on rabbits money back guarantee to purchase go to deerdefeat.com and use code radio to save 10 percent on your order deer defeat it can't be beat looking for a non-toxic fly control call the bug farm 1-800-248-BUGS bugs The number one key to healthy, productive plants are the roots. Starting from seed to full-grown plants, RootMaker.com has the answer. From seed starting trays with an innovative design that air prunes the roots, creating a fabulous root system, never again will you have root-bound plants to multiple gallon grow bag sizes to raise beds. RootMaker.com has your grow needs covered. 
Visit RootMaker.com. Use coupon code RADIO21 and get 15% off your entire order. The Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Pro Plugger, Dripworks, Walton's Incorporated, Tree Diaper, Janie's Mill, Phylum Bioproducts, Chapin Manufacturing Incorporated, Nature's Lawn and Garden Incorporated, Deer Defeat, Dr. Jim's, Root Maker. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Garden with Joy and Holly radio show. Thank you for allowing us to be part of your day today. Well, let's talk about watering. Let's talk about rain. Well, many parts of the country are not having that type of uh, availability. So Tree Diaper can help you with that situation in your garden. Well, right now or before Tree Diaper, watering shrubs, bushes, and other trees was not your favorite job on your property, let's be honest. But with Tree Diaper, it's not really a job. Tree Diaper is a revolutionary watering system that slowly releases stored rainwater when plants need it. The Tree Diaper is filled with water from rain or when you water and slowly releases water over three weeks. No pipes, hoses, or electricity needed. Whether you're a first-time gardener or advanced, Tree Diaper will improve the way you water your plants. Every time it rains, Tree Diaper recharges. Made in the USA. Check out all the sizes they have available at TreeDiaper.com. That's TreeDiaper.com. So many people have problems with uh, animals in their garden. Now, now, so there's some animals that we're happy to have in our garden. Animals, insects, butterflies, birds, uh, bees, ladybugs, that type of thing. But there's also in, uh, animals and insects that we don't want in our garden. So we're going to cover some of the animals that we want not in our garden and some of them that we do in order to kind of keep things balanced. Uh, but first... We want birds in our garden. Many people are like, no, no, I want to get birds out because they're pecking holes in this and they're destroying that. Some birds do that. Some birds, that's just part of their nature. However, uh, if you incorporate enough, uh, and, and it's not 100% foolproof, but if you create enough of an environment for them, uh, they will m- some most of the time leave things alone for you to enjoy your garden, and they can enjoy your garden as well. We've got bird feeders set up. Right, so we have the bird feeder set up. Also, when when birds are pecking holes into your tomatoes or any other kind of watery fruit, a lot of times they're just looking for water. So you could create a bird bath. You could just take like a, a shallow, um, larger bowl and put some rocks in there and some water, and that will give them a place to get some water, things like that. Yeah, we fill our bird feeders full with Wild Delight bird food. And then, you know, people are like, well, the squirrels are getting into the bird feeder. Uh, Wild Delight has that covered for you. They've got uh, a bird food that is infused with chili oil because the birds can't taste the oil, but the squirrels do not like the oil. So um, that's one way in order to keep the birds in and the squirrels away. And it's worked very well for us. Right. So that is one way. Um, So now sometimes people have squirrels or chipmunks. Chipmunks are a little bit more erratic. Squirrels, you can control them somewhat. Um, Some people choose to do methods that we won't mention on here because we want it to be somewhat of a family friendly program right uh make once they do this they don't come back ever yeah uh, but what are some ways in which we can get rid of them and not using that method sure so you can lure them away from the plants here squirrel <laughs> no, no, <laughs> no not, not that no, okay. not like that but you can so say you have your garden in the back corner or whatever you can put a squirrel feeder like in the front part of your your yard uh-huh and then that way they're like, oh, here's some tasty snacks, and they're not going to eat whatever you don't want. And believe it or not, there are people that do feed squirrels. Yeah. There are people that feed squirrels. That's There's just people that set up like little picnic mazes. tables. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All sorts of things for the squirrels. So <laughs> that's an option. Many people are trying to keep them out. Other people are like, hey, come on over, you know, that type of thing. But yeah, squirrels and chipmunks uh, can be pretty uh, damaging to uh, crops. Um, raccoons are another one. They can be damaging yeah. to your, your roof yeah. of your house. I mean, my sister just went through that. Um, so you want to look for, you put, you could do like, um, look for that. So you want to put the, the squirrel, I don't know, friendly feeder away from your garden. And then they're going to be attracted to that. You want to look for a squirrel bait. So maybe you have an acorn tree and that's attracting the squirrels. So you would want to collect those acorns and make sure that they're not, 
they're not going to continue to eat those. Uh, another thing, you know, you can have, you know, you can have uh, free range your dog or your cat in the backyard, and they can chase them, and that that's kind of fun for them. Uh, not necessarily, you know, most um, most times you, you don't have them out, you know, unless you're in the country type of thing. Uh, the squirrels. But I think squirrels are aware. Like if you have a dog or a cat, like an outdoor cat, they're less likely to come around. I know, like we growing up, we had an outdoor cat, indoor outdoor cat. And um, we didn't we didn't have a lot of squirrels bothering our little garden, so they they sense those predators. Well, another one is rabbits. Yeah, yeah. Um, I just want to mention. Yeah, go ahead. One thing about the squirrels is that if you have bare soil, that's going to encourage them to dig more. So that's another because reason. they kind of like can see what is that that there's yeah. an opportunity there to yeah. find something. So you'd want to make sure you mulch it, or if it's like just a bare spot in your yard, you want to cover that up. What have you? All right, let's uh, look talk about rabbits now. There's a couple of ways in which we can control rabbits. Um, we can cage them and get them out of the uh, off the property, or we can use deer defeat. Use our coupon code radio to save ten percent on your order. It is an all natural deer, rabbit, and groundhog repellent that works through rain, freeze, and snow, and hot temperatures, and all of the good stuff. Uh, that we experience it through the years in our garden, and uh, it's a phenomenal. It doesn't smell, so it works really, really well, and testimonies uh, uh, back us up on that as well. So that's one way to do it. Uh, deer, there's other options, and with deer, there's uh, a double fence. Holly, you can explain that. Actually, on rabbits... Um, oh, you're going to go back to rabbits. Okay. Yeah, I think people don't want to do this because it's an investment but when before we had the raised beds we had an in-ground garden right and we invested in however many feet of chicken wire uh, two foot tall about chicken 250 wire. feet of poultry wire two foot high poultry wire one inch hexagon uh, yeah. size but it was worth it it kept the rabbits up oh yeah it's yeah. amazing how quickly your green beans and your cucumbers will grow when they're not getting eaten down every evening by the neighborhood rabbits right um, so the deer, you want to do double fence where you build a, a fence where there's one fence and then within like a foot, there's another fence. And yes, that is quite the investment. Well, two footer, but it doesn't necessarily have to be the big heavy. You can do it with fishing wire too, couldn't you? I yeah. Mean, as a, on a low budget, budget type of thing. Yeah, you could do it with fishing wire. A lot of people... Fishing wire, fishing uh, fishing line. Oh, fishing yeah, People line. are yelling at us right now. It's not fishing, <laughs> it's not fishing. wire. No, it's fishing line, Obvi you, you nimrod. Obviously, yeah. we're not fishing fisher people. Fishermen and fisher, women. But yeah, fisher people. Let's just move past the fishing. Anyway, yeah. Anyway, that's one thing you can do with deer. Another thing is think about, are you, are you baiting these deer? Do you live near a high deer traffic area? Are you like mowing paths to your garden? Are you maybe like... Do you have the very sweet, tender stuff on the outer portion yeah. of the garden instead of inside and not and surrounding the outer side with less appealing uh, appetizers that deer may not necessarily want? And they're not going to walk through the garden because they're maybe not feel so secure. So uh, if you put your sweet peas and, and all that kind of wonderful stuff on the outside, they're going to sit there and eat away. And sometimes if you send your kids outside to play every evening, those deer never come around right. because... They're so spooked. Like my one of my coworkers has smaller children. They're always outside in the evenings. She doesn't have any issues with deer, but her neighbor does because the neighbor won't come in. The deer won't come in her yard, but they'll go in the neighbor's yard. Yeah. Uh, cats and dogs. Now, if you've got your own cats and dogs, uh, you maybe can train them or, or watch them as they go in the backyard. However. Um, uh, citrus is a very good deterrent for cats and dogs. Uh, simply just orange peels, you throw them on top of the ground, and that will help uh, detour or cause an, uh, a fragrance in which they're not wonderfully appealing to them. Uh, lavender is another smell in which cats do not like. Um, what are some other ways in which we can uh, get rid of cats? Now, if, it's, if, they're, if they're neighborhood cats, as much as you may not want to, um, you can trap them, live trap them, and then have the Humane Society come and pick them up or, or take them somewhere else. I, I've i never really had any experience with cats, but I know, like, one thing you can do is make it so that if they are walking around your garden, you can make a perimeter of, like, pine cones. Yeah, they don't they like don't, prickly they, yeah, things. Yeah, they don't like prickly things on their paws. Well, here on the uh, 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 story time, um, back on the farm, you know, if you, if you grew up on a farm, there's a lot of rural areas that listen to the program. 
you know that during peak times of the year, you may have, well, for my experience, we had 20 cats. And then all of a sudden, about three months, we had 65 cats. And the population would go up and down based on how things worked out, you know, whether the cats ran away, whether they got, you know, things happened, they got sick, they didn't, you know, didn't recover. Um, but we never had a snake. Uh, we never had a rat. We never had a mouse. Uh, and they were just everywhere on the farm. So that is one way kind of to fix the problems with other issues you may be having is having that population of felines. Right. That is when we had three dogs too. So, right. so a lot of times your, your pets or whatever they are on the farm, the barn cats. Yeah. They're, yeah. I mean, they're, they're part of the farm. They keep things in check. Yeah. Uh, yeah. They're part of the, the farm ecosystem. Yeah. You go. Yeah. Um, chickens. I, I don't, I guess, why would you let your chickens? Well, you control bugs. I mean, but it's not something you're going to let them go in the garden overnight or anything, but a few, you know, if you're watching them, they can do a lot of good things, pick a lot of bad bugs off of, uh, of your garden. So just something else to kind of keep and in people mind. People build those chicken tractors Yeah, that run around. Yeah. Um, we don't have, I don't have much experience with chickens at all. Right. I do know if you order an egg at a restaurant, you want it to be hatched. <laughs> yeah. What? Yeah. Scrambled, hatched. You want at least to have open oh, egg. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Well, with that being said, summer is already here. We're in full swing and we're not looking back. But hey, if you've been on social media, if you've been in your backyard, those Japanese beetles are here and already wreaking havoc on all of your vegetation. Yeah, if you're looking to successfully control beetles without damaging the environment, look no further than Beetle Gone from Phylum Bioproducts. Derived from a naturally occurring soil bacteria, Beetle Gone is the only organic solution that successfully controls beetle invaders. Just mix the powder with water and spray on your plants. Once ingested, the target pest will stop feeding and die. And since it's an organic BT product, you know it's a great choice to use on your fruits and veggies in addition to your ornamental flowers and trees. Not only does Beetle Gone work, but the best part about the product is that is it's safe to use around beneficial insects such as ladybugs, butterflies, and bees and has no issue with water toxicity. That's Beetle Gone from PhylumBioproducts.com. That's P-H-Y-L-L-O-M Bioproducts. Dot com. Well, when we come back, it is time to talk with PBS's host of Growing a Greener World, Joe Lample, will be with us. So hang around. You're listening to the Garden with Joey and Holly radio show. Have a garden question? Give Joey and Holly a call now or anytime 24-7. Just dial 1-800-927-SHOW. If you can't get through, leave a message and they will call you back. Call now 1-800-927-SHOW. This week's garden tip is brought to you by Yard Glider, the cart without wheels, loads without lifting, hauls more, dumps faster, built to last, and built for hard work. Multiple sizes available at YardGlider.com. That's YardGlider.com. Mowing your grass high, three to four inches, has many great benefits. One, it shades out weeds. It also reduces the evaporation from the soil as it produces shade. And there's many beneficial insects that can live and thrive in that tall grass. It promotes establishment of large root systems, which is more drought tolerant. The clippings can also fall through the grass, not be seen, and feed the soil. This week's garden tip was brought to you by Yard Glider. The cart without wheels, loads without lifting, hauls more, dumps faster, built to last, and built for hard work. Perfect for homeowners, arborists, hunters, landscapers. Pull it behind an ATV, a lawnmower, or pull it yourself. Multiple sizes available at YardGlider.com. That's YardGlider.com. You move your lawn sprinklers all over the yard, but you always end up putting them in the same spots. Why not just bury them there? Out of sight, always ready to use, pre-adjusted to water the precise areas you want. Quick Snap Sprinklers makes it easy. In-ground sprinklers without the hassle or expense of laying pipe. Put the sprinklers anywhere in your lawn or garden. Snap on a hose to supply the water. Water on, it pops up. Water off, it drops below ground. You can mow right over it. You can have a buried sprinkler system up and running in just minutes. Each quick snap saves thousands of dollars. They install in minutes and operate for years. Visit quicksnapsprinkler.com. Rinse kit, your hose on the go. Pressurized water at your fingertips without pumping or battery. Simply fill from your spigot or sink on your way out to the garden, beach, or anywhere. Spray it, wash it, rinse kit. Joey here from the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Are you looking for merchandise to wear or to use to support the program or a shirt that has a witty 
comical or logical saying on it, look no further than thatismyshirt.com. Shirts that have logos of the show or sayings such as don't be just average today or valedictorian of Common Sense University, I Heart Compost, and many other great sayings that you can wear from long sleeve to short sleeve to hoodies, thatismyshirt.com has all of that and a whole lot more. That website again is thatismyshirt.com. Take a look, see what's available from sizes from small to 5X. That is my shirt. Com. Tired of dealing with bugs but don't want to use harmful chemicals to repel them? Naturally Green No More Bugs is all natural and plant-based. No more chemical bug repellent. Use it around your home and on you, indoors and out. DEET free and will not stain. Repels mosquitoes, ticks, fleas, roaches, ants, flies, and more. No More Bugs is the answer to what is bugging you. Stop using harmful chemicals and use what is safe for you, your family, pets, and the environment. For more information, visit natgreenproducts.com. Natgreenproducts.com. Com. Soul Brew Kombucha is founded and handcrafted in Milwaukee, 100% organic, formulated for ultimate health and enjoyment. Find out the benefits of drinking kombucha and where to purchase at MySoulBrew.com or find them on Facebook at MySoulBrew. Protect your plants against damage with a 3-in-1 plant guard and special blend fertilizer. Visit IvyOrganics.com. The Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show is brought to you by the following. Simply Earth, Seed Savers Exchange, Quick Snap Sprinklers, Water Hoop, Timber Pro Coatings, Bloom and Easy Plants, Pomona Universal Pectin, Ivy Organics, Tiger Torch, Happy Leaf LED, Seed Link. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joey and Holly radio show. Moment, moments away Joe Lample will be with us, but first, you got Japanese beetles flying around. We got a product from Rescue that can uh, get them under control and eliminate them. Yep, Japanese beetle traps, when used properly, draw beetles away from your plants and trees. The trick is to hang, hang them 30 feet from plants you want to protect. That way, you can lure the beetles away from the areas where they cause damage and trap them. Rescue Japanese beetle traps are only traps with controlled release lure that lasts the entire beetle season. Their extra large bag is welded directly to the trap and stays put even when it's full of beetles. And Rescue Japanese Beetle Traps is the only trap with a reusable bag that opens and closes at the bottom. It, during beetle, If the beetle season is a bad one, you just open, empty, keep trapping the beetles with the same trap. You can find all this information at rescue.com. It's made in the USA. Again, that's rescue.com. Uh, Holly, let's go to the hotline and bring in our guest for this week. Joel Lample is not only an experienced gardener, but an author, blogger, podcaster, and host of the well-known PBS show, Growing a Greener World. Welcome to the program, Joel. Hey, Holly. Thank you. Well, Joel, we thank you for taking time out of your very busy schedule, not only to educate Holly and myself, but all of our listeners across the country. I'm glad to be here. Well, let's start off with some tomato problems. You experienced uh, a couple of issues recently with your tomato patch, and why don't you share that story with you and how you figured out the diagnostics of what the issue was? Yeah, boy, I'll tell you, no two years are the same, right? So um, I started noticing wilt on one of my plants that had grown really well, was producing a lot of tomatoes, and then suddenly... It just started wilting, and I was scratching my head about it because I'm aware of soil-borne diseases that can cause wilt, such as verticillium or fusarium or southern blight. But as I was watering at the base of the plant with my watering wand, which I often do because I enjoy hand watering, and it gives me a chance to stare my plant down and notice any changes. But I was putting pressure on the soil with the end of my watering wand, and the watering wand was just easily going into the soil whereas you know normally you would think it would just stop at the base and stop but it was like sinking in and then i was watching the soil and it was like imploding around my plant and i'm like what the and so the more i pushed the wand into the soil the easier it was for the wand to continue to go and penetrate deeper into my raised beds which are 18 inches and i thought something's not right here and i pretty much knew right away at that point, what it was, because I'd seen mole tunnels between my beds, which only told me that they were probably burrowing underneath the, the wood to get into the all-you-can-eat buffet of worms in my soil. And so, 
you know, it's like submarines in the ocean that are, you know, about to fire these, 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 um, torpedoes that are going to take out whatever their target is. And in my case, the tor- the submarines were the moles and the torpedoes were just there gnawing through the roots and eating the worms and make wreaking havoc underground in that soil food web. And it was really wreaking havoc on my plants. And so, uh, that's what happened. And I kept watering, hoping that I would get some recovery and the roots would re- regenerate and so forth. But in the case of a couple plants, that just never happened. So I haven't taken them out yet because I haven't had the heart to do it, but I'm ready to throw in the towel on those. And then on the other ones that I had, Will, that's Southern Blight, which is a bacterial disease that uh, is soil borne. And it comes from just a buildup over time of, you know, planting the same family in the same location too many years in a row. And I raised my hand to that as being guilty because I love growing tomatoes and I don't have an unlimited space to do it. So I defy the odds or think I can and put the same plants in the same location year after year. And sure enough, it comes in and bites me. And um, now I'm dealing with plants that can't survive certain certain varieties of tomatoes that aren't aren't weathering the storm. So I'm experimenting right now, pulling those out and putting different varieties in back in place. It's too early to tell if they're going to survive or not. But um, it's so frustrating because these are things that you can't see above ground. You can't do anything about it. And you just watch it happen before your eyes. And, you know, when you have high expectations and you you keep a bar very high and those kind of things happen, it's humbling. And it reminds you that Mother Nature is totally in charge. And, you you know, you have to just stay on your toes. Now, two questions in regards to that. One, how many years do you feel or do you know it's safe to plant the tomatoes in the same spot? And then with a problem such as this, do you take that and turn that into a teaching lesson for the, the television show? Yeah. I say first part of your question, I'd say two years, three years max before you start the, the, the uh, pathogens start to build up in excess to the point that, you know, you're not going to get away from it. It's just a matter of time, Joey. And then um, any, anything that I do is a teachable moment. Uh, you know, it's great to showcase all the successes, but where I really feel we all learn is through our challenges, our learning opportunities. Some people call them failures. I look at everything as a chance to learn more and improve upon it. And so if I can have those learning opportunities like anyone else, all the better, because I'm in a, I'm in a, a position of high exposure. And so a lot of people can learn from my mistakes and I'm happy I'm happy to make them on their behalf, you know, because if I can share what I discovered and how I learned what I learned and how to correct it or make improvements, all the better. And, you know, I don't I don't have an ego such that I'm a beyond, you know, sharing what I'm learning, too. We're all in this together. And the thing is, we're all making mistakes or, you know, these opportunities. And as long as we share what we observed and what we're trying to do to fix it, and especially if we do figure it out all the better. I mean, we all need to do that more often. You know, we need to let our pride go and again, remember that we're not in charge and just, um, we're always learning. And to me, that's one of the most fascinating and most inspiring parts of gardening is that the unlimited opportunities to learn, you never run out of those. And it just makes us better. Every time we encounter something like that, it just makes us stronger and better and more confident in, in going forward. So I'm all for sharing those instances anytime I encounter them. And and from a product, pr- production standpoint, you know, 20, 20 years ago in the mid-90s, you know, w- with people who had gardening shows, they didn't show failures because they had X amount of minutes to make something happen and make it look wonderful, and that was it. That whole mindset has changed now that, hey, here's what I did, here's what I did wrong, so you don't do that. Joey, that is such a great thing that you just said, because I can tell you, going back to my first television show on as a gardening host for DIY Network, before I ever went on camera for the first day, I had a pre-production meeting with my producer, and she sat me down, and probably the very first thing she said, I'll never forget it, but I think it was like the first thing she said, and she said this, she said, let me just make it clear, failure is not an option, <laughs> and I'm like, you're not a gardener, yeah. I mean, how is that possible? And, and, you know, in three years, we really only did have about one or two failures, but I advocated for sharing that with, uh, with the audience and the DIY network executives agreed with me. They embraced it. 
and it was the best thing we ever did. That's amazing. Um, so some, some part of the countries are in a drought. Some of us have too much rain. Some of us are finally getting the rain we need. And um, what are your best watering tips to have the, the best watering season throughout the season? Work on your soil. Create soil that drains well. When you get too much rain, it, it's draining well. But when you add organic matter and you have you know humus in there and you have um, particulates that can hold on to water particles, then the water is going to be available to the plants in times of drought. So you have the best of both worlds. And, and all you really need to do at the core is focus on building healthy soil. And if you can do that, you're going to have soil that's going to drain well, and yet it's going to hold moisture. And then in addition to that, above ground, you're setting up your watering system so that they are sort of on autopilot, such as with drip irrigation or soaker hoses on timers, so that you know, on average every week, you're, you've got it dialed in to provide, let's just call it an inch of water over a week. And, um, and that really does it. And I got to tell you, Holly, there's very little times where I need to go out and supplement my watering. But you also have to take into consideration what you're planting into. For example, are you planting in ground? Are you planting in raised beds? Are you doing grow bags or straw bales? Because depending on what you're planting in, there are greater needs, such as with containers or grow bags, probably you need to water every day, but not in a large raised bed and certainly not in ground. But that's part of the process of learning your environment and adapting and being a thinking gardener, you know, uh, applying what you're observing and making those corrections and adjustments to appropriately deliver that water. Absolutely. Now with your program, Growing a Greener World, check your local PBS station for time and availability in your area. What is uh, a, a memorable or unique a moment that you have had on a recent episode of Growing a Greener World? Um, I think uh, the one that just jumps out at me when you said that, when you refer- referenced recently, was just, just being reminded of the joy of gardening. There was a couple that, ironically, you know, we traveled the country to tell these stories. And there was a couple that lives literally less than two miles from me down the road. And I discovered them because they had a sign stuck on the street that said plant sale. And I was running some errands and I saw the sign. And I said, what the heck? I'll go check it out. I have plenty of plants, but I'm always interested. And it turned, I, I came into a neighborhood I'd never been into before, just down the street, pulled in, pulled along the street. And there were lots of cars there. And I walked upon their, their garden. It was amazing. This huge, beautiful food garden in their front yard followed by this wonderful native woodland garden in their backyard and water ponds. And just on top of the beauty and the serenity of this garden, the couple, the husband and wife, the love that they had for each other and the passion they had for gardening and the joy that they got by doing it together. They were soulmates and they were gardening partners for over 40 years. And, and the, the feeling you got from being around them or even just watching the show, because it was the most watched show we ever did for our past season, season 11 by far, the comments have come in from around the world, but it, their their story translated and, and, you know, having been there and spent time with them and getting to know them, when we watched the show, we edited it and we put it out there. We didn't feel like it translated like we had seen it firsthand because I don't think you can really translate that truly through broadcast, but apparently we were successful enough at it that it really resonated with er many, many people that watched it because they got it. But it just, it just, I think it was a message of showing the joy that one person or two people together can have with gardening. And, you know, when you have that person that you can do that with, that shares that passion with you, it just makes it all the better. And it was a wonderful reminder and we've become good, close fast friends and we spend time a lot together but it was a, one of the highlights of my career filming television was just meeting this couple in a serendipitous moment of a plant sale sign and it turned into a strong friendship and a real admiration for this couple that has is so passionate for gardening and and the love that they have for each other and it was just a great story and a it just epitomized what I love trying to find for those stories we tell on Growing a Greener World. And you travel all over North America and halfway around the world, and you went two miles, and there it was. I know. 
I know. That's what cracks me up. And thank God, you know, Joey, the ironic thing was, thank this was during COVID. Right. Because we couldn't travel. And yet one of the best shows we ever did was because of COVID, we're at home and here it was two miles down the road. Never would have happened otherwise. Right. Exactly. Well, let's talk about raised beds. You grow in raised beds. How does one uh, feed the raised bed or keep the soil productive year after year? What's the key there? The key is to amend it with organic matter, namely compost, once or twice a year, as I do between the growing season. So coming out of my cool season and the late spring coming into summer, uh, when, the, when the beds, I clean out my, my crops that are kind of on the tail end my brassicas and my cool season crops to make room for the summer crops. And while I have that blank slate, I go ahead and top dress with about an inch of compost. And a lot of times I'll use a broad fork and I'll open up some space in the soil. That's not tilling. It's just opening up a little bit of space in the soil. The compost makes its way down a little bit deeper. And then I plant my uh, warm crops and vice versa at the end of the warm season crops, the garden gets cleaned out again for my cool season. So I repeat the top dressing, soil amending, composting a couple times a year. But even if you did it once, that's great because there's so much in compost that money can't buy. The microbiology, the nutrients, the microbes, all of those things that work symbiotically in the soil to feed the plant. So you're, you're amending the soil, so you're feeding the soil and then the soil is taking care of feeding the plants by providing soluble based food that the roots can access as needed because you have created that environment for the soil biota to go to work and make that happen. So it's not so much fertilizer, Joey. It's not like feeding the plants with synthetic fertilizer. You're feeding the soil with what nature intended for them to have that allows them to get the nutrients they need and the texture and the tilth and the drainage and the and the moisture retention all of those things happens because you just focus on good organic matter namely compost now do you feed your plants with an organic fertilizer or do you rely on that compost to do that feeding yeah for the most part i rely on the compost but but about every two weeks during the most active time of the growing season i do supplement it with a a a fish emulsion basically uh in the First month, I'll do a, like a 5-1-1 ratio, nitrogen to phosphorus to potassium. And then as we go into flower and fruiting, I switch over to another fish-based product, which is basically a 2-3-1 ratio, or a little more emphasis on phosphorus to develop the flower and the fruit. And, you know, I'm, I don't do that a lot, just, you know, two week, every two weeks at the most. But, you know, a lot of what I'm growing are very heavy feeders and the, the tomatoes that I'm growing. So they really benefit from that and they show it so um that's what i do but then i get into the fall garden and i really never fertilize it i rely on the compost and those plants could not be more productive or more healthy or more beautiful and i'm not doing anything in addition to just building the soil that's really that's really great helpful advice so we really enjoyed having you on on the show um how can people find out more about you and all of your great wonderful gardening information joegardener.com is is the place where you could probably find everything else you need to know we link to a lot from the main website and then my instagram handle is at joegardener and i'm active there and so those are a couple good places to find me yeah, and then the Joe Gardener Show podcast. And, and, and the uh, Instagram, you do a lot of uh, videos and take, you know, straight out in the garden and people have questions and you, you try to answer them right there on the spot. So very interactive. Thank you. It's all real, man. There's no fluff. It's just who <laughs> yeah. I am. And I, I share I share my mistakes as well as my wins. And, and that that's uh, a big, big benefit in today's society is to show those mistakes uh, because not everybody... People, the, the 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 mindset of oh I, I never make a mistake uh, doesn't make people look too good. Nope, that is not authentic, and uh, you know we don't need that. That doesn't help anybody. Well, Joe, we greatly appreciate the time you've given us. Uh, thank you so much for being with us and educating not only Holly and myself but all of our listeners. My pleasure, you two. Take care, and and I look forward to catching up again later. Absolutely. Thank you. And when we come back, it's going to be about your garden questions, our garden answers. This is the Garden with Joey and Holly radio show. Got a question for Joey and Holly? Send it via email anytime to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. 
Straight from the farm, fields, and briar patch, Piper and Leaf Artisan Tea is a tea like you've never imagined it. Get our award-winning tea delivered right to your front door and become part of the Piper and Leaf family. Free shipping over $75 at piperandleaf.com. Brought to you by Blue Ribbon Organics, providing locally made organic compost and soil blends for gardens, farms, landscaping, and more. Visit blueribbonorganics.com or call 262-497-8539 to find their products nearest you. We've been using a game-changing tool called Seedlink to find and review our seeds this year. It makes finding the right seeds simple. It is driven by growers' data so you can really see what's best for your location. Check it out at seedlink.com or download the mobile app today. Pomona's Universal Pectin is a high-quality pectin that gels reliably with low amounts of any sweetener. If you're trying to reduce the amount of sugar in your diet, you'll love Pomona's Universal Pectin. Now you can make healthy homemade jams and jellies sweetened to your taste. You can use sugar or honey to sweeten. Pomona's Universal Pectin keeps indefinitely when stored in an airtight container. Easy to use, versatile, and comes with directions and recipes in every box. Find out more and where to buy at PomonaPectin.com. Also available at natural food stores and online. Are you frustrated by how hard and dry your soil gets at this time of the year? You're not alone. The problem is that your soil has a high clay content. The clay shrinks and hardens as it dries, squeezing the air out of the soil. When soils are tight, roots are under stress and can no longer absorb water and nutrients easily. If you want to start improving your compacted clay soil, give Aerify Plus a try. For 20 years, homeowners and landscapers have been using liquid Aerify Plus to aerate and bioactivate their soils. Aerify Plus contains a soil penetrant as well as a liquid humates and seaweed. Visit our friends at natureslawn.com to find out more about this amazing Aerify Plus product. That's natureslawn.com. The Water Hoop is a portable water sprinkler system that allows you to target water evenly around the root ball of your tree or bush. Conforms to various shapes for your watering needs. The Water Hoop reduces runoff and saves money. Visit waterhoop.com. Do you need to kill weeds organically or melt ice quickly? Visit tigertorchltd.com for more information. Dig planting holes from a comfortable standing position. Step, twist, pull, and plant. Visit propluggercom Protect your plants against damage with a 3-in-1 plant guard and special blend fertilizer. Visit ivyorganics.com. And Holly Radio Show is brought to you by the following. Blue Ribbon Organics, Naturally Green Products, Ironwood Tool Company, Easy Step Products, Rinse Kit, Soul Brew Kabucha, Wild Delight, Rycon Vitova, Chip Drop, Bailbuster.com. Find all sponsors at the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com and thank them for their support. Welcome back to the Gardening with Joy and Holly Radio Show. Time for a question and answer. You have a question? Send it on over. You can do that via email at GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. That's GardenTalkRadio at gmail.com. Or if you'd like to talk to us, give us a call. Toll free, coast to coast, 1-800-927-SHOW. That's 1-800-927-SHOW, 1-800-927-7468. Nine had a number of questions come in this week. We'll see what we can get through to the top of the hour. Uh, Holly, what? Uh, let's see here. Something I've never understood is why it's called sunchokes. They look nothing like artichokes. They are not related to them at all. They're a tuber and not uh, and not a flower or fruit. And from what I have read, they taste like a potato, but sweeter, which that's kind of true. It has a little earthy taste. This is a Jerusalem artichoke or a sunchoke. Um, Why are they called that and not something more uh, relatable? Sure. So they're also sometimes called sunroots, earth apples, and then obviously sunchokes. They're neither artichokes or they're from Jerusalem. Um, And it does have that that brown skin um, that makes it a tuber like a potato. Um, and it's actually a member of the sunflower family with origins in Northern America and Canada. Um, so yeah, it's the, re- I think the reason why is because there's a Spanish word called girasol or girasol, which is the word for sunflower. Um, and due to its resemblance of the flower, it makes, because it make it makes like, it looks like a sunflower kind of like a smaller sunflower, um, and so then artichoke was added to the end. It's it's just uh, a name for it, a common name. There's no, like, real 
real reasoning. Okay. Uh, next question. Jeremiah, listening to us on Wham 1600 out of Ann Arbor on his way to work, he says, I don't do much gardening, but actually enjoy your show when driving to work on the weekends. We planted a little garden with some basic vegetables in it, and it's doing quite well in some of the raised beds, uh, but I was wanting to try some pumpkins for my six-year-old. I know they run a lot and take up a good amount of space, but was wanting to see maybe the best way to plant them. I have seen where you break up the ground and then basically do a mound of fresh topsoil on top of the ground and then do about three seeds per mound. Any advice would be appreciated. Okay, well, we thank you for listening to the program on your way to work uh, on the weekends. Uh, yes, uh, you can plant them. The reason why people put them in a mound is if they're in, that allows that mound, you know, it's about size, of, you know, two dinner plates, let's say, and about six to eight inches above ground, a little plateau type of, uh, shape. Uh, you're doing that or people do that traditionally in order to get more topsoil in the root system and have a lot more fluffiness to that soil and to uh, let the roots grow down deeper. This also is beneficial if you are in, uh, you get a lot of rain, it doesn't flood your garden out. Um, but it, it does, uh, pumpkins do take quite a bit of space, uh, you know, between 30 and 100 square feet based on this type of pumpkin. You certainly can plant them, uh, put them in the ground very, very soon, if not today, because they take a anywhere from 90 to 130 days, even longer in order to mature. And putting three seeds in that mound is a good number. And then once they are sprouted or germinated, cut back all but one. may seem like it's a terrible waste, but you're going to allow that plant to have ample space in order to grow correctly. But if you're in a raised bed or you've got very good loose soil or dry soil or you're in a dry area, don't worry about mounding or putting that little plateau out or that little hill or mound. Put it directly in the ground to try to get as much moisture to it as possible. And in a raised bed, you don't have to worry about it. All right. Next question. What is the best time to harvest sage in my garden? Yep, so the, the early, best time is early in the morning. Sage and most herbs, just as the dew evaporates, but before the heat of the day, so it doesn't stress out the plant or any of the, um, the any additional areas of the plant that are still there. And that's kind of true for a lot of vegetables and fruit. If you can harvest them after they've come off that very relaxing, cool nighttime and before they get to stress, they're, they're more flavorable, flavorable at that point. Uh, during the uh, time frame. And that's why a lot of times farmers markets don't start until later on in the morning. In order for them to harvest that very early. So I'm growing romaine lettuce for the first time and now it's starting to grow vertical and when I taste it it's very bitter. Should I pull it out of the ground? It doesn't taste very edible or is it going to get better? Okay so if it's going vertical it's going to seed or going to bolt. Uh, daylight temperature, uh, daylight length and temperature is a key factor in this. It's bitter because it's going to seed. So you can do one of two things here. You can leave that plant alone, let it do its cycle, let it flower. It's going to produce seed. You can save that seed, plant it again next year or in the fall. Or as it's doing its going to seed process, bolting process, you can remove the plant in its entirety or however many, how much ever lettuce you think you're going to consume at one setting and take the leaves off of the stem. You're going to take and put it on a cutting board and take a pizza cutter, one of the rolly things that you cut pizza with, and cut the central vein out of each leaf. So you're going to cut the vein out. You're going to have two pieces of leaf. Those pieces of leaf are as edible and as crunchy and as tasteful as lettuce was ever designed to be. The vein is what contains that bitterness. So we've got a number. We've got about 10 star or 10 bundles or 10 plants of romaine going to seed right now. And that is what we are doing because we can't consume all the romaine lettuce that's out, out in our garden. So you take that center vein out, you eat the leaves that's remaining, nothing's wrong with it. Uh, and you can do that for as long as you need to, uh, as long as you keep the plant healthy. Well, with that being said, we are out of time and we greatly appreciate the time you allow us to be part of your day. Miss any portion of this program or would you like to revisit it? You can do that a couple of ways. You can send us an email to gardentalkradio at gmail.com. That's gardentalkradio at gmail.com. Or you can go to our parent website, the WisconsinVegetableGardener.com, and click on the Season 5 tab at the top of the page. 
uh, and you can catch up on all past shows there. Uh, do not miss next week's show. We're going to be going over vermicomposting and worms, as well as gardening, no matter your body size. And uh, founder of ampleharvest.org, Gary Oppenheimer, will be with us, and will answer your garden questions. So until next week, for... Holly Baird. I'm Joy Baird, and we will see you in the garden. <laughs>